Hi, I'm Aaron Edelheit with Mindset Capital. This interview is with Rick Hermans, the CEO of HireQuest. HireQuest is a franchise staffing company. Why in the world would you want to spend the next hour listening to a conversation with the CEO of a small staffing company? Well, let's start off by talking about pizza. Domino's Pizza stock is up over 4,000% in the last 10 years. Why? Because they have perfected a franchise model that provides value to everyone in the ecosystem. A properly built franchise is a cash flow machine with incredibly high margins that can provide fantastic returns for shareholders. I wanted to interview Rick because after three decades in the staffing industry, I believe he has perfected a franchise system that aligns incentives and creates value for everyone involved. I also believe he is one of the best CEOs I've ever come across. I wanted to understand why he went public. After all, his private business was printing cash flow. And how he went public was remarkable. He bought Command Center, an underperforming staffing company, and then converted it to HireQuest's superior franchise model. And when you look back through the numbers, you will find HireQuest was able to go public and buy Command Center for free and with no debt. A remarkable achievement. In this interview, you'll get a sense of the breadth and size of the opportunity that Rick sees not only in the commercial staffing space, but also in security guards, landscaping, janitorial services, and more. Pay close attention to his idea of rolling down an industry, not rolling one up. HireQuest's magic is in bringing agency and incentives to the people who are actually running the local staffing branches. I am grateful that Rick took the time to talk with me, and I hope you enjoy our conversation. Thank you for coming on and uh, agreeing to this interview. My first question is, so you were a profitable private company generating millions of dollars of net income with a small group of owners, including yourself. And then you decide to merge with Command Center and go public. Why? Why go public? Why buy Command Center? So those are really almost two different questions, right? As far as why buying Command Center, buying Command Center was uh, a way to basically expand geographically very quickly. So that, that, that was almost, almost the perfect acquisition from the perspective of they were heavy in the Northwest. And of course we were historically always heavy in the Southeast. And so from that perspective, it was really a, uh, really a perfect acquisition. As far as on the other one, that's a that's sort of a deeper question. And you know the the the, the funny answer is is that back in about 1998, so 23 you know 23 years ago, it was already part of my vision to go public. The the, the funny thing about it was always my vision to to go public, and uh, you know in part because of the, you know, sort of the credibility that being public brings with larger clients. So that's, that's part of it. But really, even then, as I, as sort of, as I got older, and as we got more profitable, uh, you know, it was kind of funny as you start looking at, okay, to go to the next step, to buy a command, the, the and of course, I was the majority shareholder. So it was, the question was, okay, I could go out and personally borrow a bunch of money to get larger, which, you know, you know, didn't seem like a good idea for me in the long run, because sooner or later, you know, sooner or later, I really wasn't, really wasn't, was never desirous of selling uh, the company to like a private equity group, because I really do care about my franchisees, and I care about my employees. And it's kind of like, on the other hand, though, is like, I can only put so much money into one investment. And so merging with Command Center that was already public made a ton of sense, because like I said, as I said before, geographically, but then also going public. And, you know, part of that, it, it, and it was always, uh, it, even five or six years ahead of time, it was like, as you said before, we were always profitable. We've been profitable for 20 years. We've never, 
I think the last time we lost money was like 1999 or something like that. We've never, you know, always been profitable. And one of the funny parts about it, and what we were constantly being told is, ah, you really can't go public. That's dumb. The costs will eat you up, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you won't get a following or anything like that. I'm just like, gosh, dang, there's so many small, really badly run micro caps. It's like, there's gotta be a market for a small company that's actually really profitable. And, you know, so it's, 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 and I think that's been the case is, is it's taken a while for us to convince people that, Hey, this is a profitable company. This is, this is kind of unusual for a, for a micro cap. And it doesn't, it doesn't take any fancy, you know, we don't, we're not looking for FDA approval of some new cutting edge biotech discovery or anything like that. It's just a, it's, it's just a, it's our same template that we've been using for 20 years. And it's just now, you know, it's sort of just getting it out there and telling people and then, you know, and educating people on sort of what our model is and why it makes a lot of sense. So when you, when you, when you go back to 1998, you said something interesting that it was always your plan to go public. And is it and the reason why I'm asking why go public and the, you came public and you were very, you were very profitable private business, you merge with command center, command center is public. So you become public, you kind of take over command center. But I guess the reason I ask why is I want to go back to the 1998. Is it, has it always been your desire and, and kind of vision to build a larger company that is publicly traded so that you can really expand in this, in, in, in the industry? Uh, I want yeah, to just explore that. that. Good, yeah, that's a good question. And I, I was remiss to say that and because that, that is part of it. Because obviously, you know, as a private company, you have only so much access to capital unless you keep putting it in yourself. And so, yes, the, the, the reason was and still is, is the ability to continue to grow. It, 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 being public gives us the ability to grow at a, frankly, exponentially higher rate than what we were in the past because we have access to you know is to have better access to capital to create that base the two acquisitions we just did while we did do them you know in cash um we could have just as easily you know um issued a bit of stock in order to you know in order to to do them and so it allows us to maintain a healthy capital structure and yet grow dynamically. And so that was that was always what it was, is it's kind of like, because otherwise to grow, you know, to grow organically takes a long time. It takes, you know, take it, it, it takes a while. Yes, you know, during from 2009 to 2019, we certainly grew at, you know, generally 12 to 25% a year, which is nice growth in and of itself organically, but obviously, you know, once again, it, it, it's not the same as what we just experienced with, with Link and with, with Snelling. And yet again, being public gives us the ability to make sure that our capital structure stays very healthy. And so I guess this leads to the, that you really see an opportunity to accelerate the growth and the kind of the, that, what you're doing with HireQuest and, and build it to just a much larger scale. Than it is today. No, there's no question. So, you know, that being said, I, I need I need to always stress whenever I mean whenever I talk to anybody, is our goal is not to grow for the sake of growth. There are there are companies out there that that that's all they're you know that that's all they're looking for is that top line growth. We're not we're not interested in top line. I mean, we're interested in top line growth, but we're only interested in top line growth to the extent that it creates bottom line growth and that it, we, we retain our margins and we continue to grow. But the reality is, is there are no, there are, I shouldn't say no, but there are virtually no limitations on our ability to grow other than the capital to buy, to buy entities. Because what we do because of our franchise model, we don't have the operating risk that a lot of other companies do. And, and what I mean by that is if I'm, 
you know, I'm staffing company X and I want to buy staffing company Y and they're both company owned stores. The problem is, is when I go out and I buy company Y, you know, is that I may well lose their best salespeople or the owner might've been sort of the linchpin to keeping that customer list together. And so I'm out there thinking, I just bought a book of $10 million of business that turns to 5 million and any efficiencies that maybe I was able to bring get wiped out because I just lost half the business because I lost their two best salespeople or their best recruiters or whatever. The beauty of the franchising model that we do and, and how it helps us in our growth is that we're not left in a situation where you know, we spend the next 12 to 18 months just trying to retain what the seller had already uh, had already achieved. I mean, the, the, the funny part about it is, let's say we've already seen it with Snelling and Link. Basically, I mean, their revenues haven't, haven't changed. Or for that matter, you know, it's, hard to, it's always hard to tell with command because of the pandemic. But even with the pandemic, I mean, you know, the, the, you know, a lot of those command offices held up very well. But command wasn't Command wasn't a franchise business. That was a vertically integrated model. And you converted them very quickly to franchise. And it actually leads to my question, like what was, what is wrong with the, not, I don't know if wrong is the right word, but what, why is the, your franchise model so much more powerful than that vertically integrated model of what command center was doing. You know, could so you go into like the incentive structure or what you're specifically doing that is creating so much opportunity inside the staffing industry? And maybe use command center as an example. Yeah, command center would be a good example. And, and by the way, so the reason why I, I put command center in there with, let's say with Link to start with, with Link and with Snelling is, the people were kept in place, the, which is a big deal. So in other words, there was, you know, when we bought Command Center, the offices were immediately converted to franchises. And generally speaking, the same people were in the offices after the merger than were before. And it's that turnover that creates, that creates the risk. And so with our model and sort of like, so why it works compared to vertically, let's say to a vertically integrated company is a couple of fold is, is that, and it's funny, if you look at the history of most staffing companies, they probably started off where they had two or three great offices. Maybe they started in Chicago or they started in, um, they started in uh, Minnesota or wherever. It doesn't really matter where they, where they started. Generally, they so they, they started in a place like, let's say, Chicago. Maybe they had two great offices. They were in Chicago and Indianapolis. And they grow, and then they sit there and say, well, hey, let's open in Detroit. And then a client may say, let's go to Iowa. And what happens with these vertically integrated companies is it gets harder and harder. You know, what, what maybe, what really made Chicago great was because they had a founder and two or three great salespeople, and they really built it up. That doesn't mean that that's going to automatically replicate when you go out and you run, you know, a, you know, an Indeed ad or a ZipRecruiter ad. You find a new manager in Minnesota. Doesn't you know Minneapolis? Doesn't mean it's going to be nearly as good as the person in Chicago. And so what happens over time is yes, you pick up certain cost efficiencies. You get better workers' comp. You get maybe cheaper money. You 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 get to spread your administrative staff over a bigger base of sales. But, but over time, those become, you know, those become sort of less and less sort of important as far as in the cost structure. And what happens then is, is you have this far flung group of offices, which means then you've got to go out and hire regional managers to make sure that the people are, you know, that the, the, these new branch managers that you now have all over the place are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so what happens is, is you get you know, basically your expenses get killed because you, you've got a bad manager, you know, you've got to make sure that your, your manager, you know, the, the, that, are, that are far flung 
are being supervised. Well, okay, now you've got a 80, 100, $120,000 a year person, you know, overseeing them. And then all of a sudden the person quits. And now you've got a person living out of a hotel to run that branch for six weeks. And at the end of the day, you don't make any more money. In fact, you actually deteriorate. You're, you'd have probably been better off staying just in Chicago where you started because of the big, the big infrastructure you've got to build. For us, because we're franchised, we really don't have to worry about the person in Des Moines, Iowa quitting because they're the franchise. They're the franchise. It's their business. And that's why when you look at, for example, um, Command Center as an example is about half the size of HireQuest. It had, it had about six regional managers. We had one. And so to give you a sense of that, that means that if, if, if effectively command center was paying something close to six tenths of a percent just for regional managers, we were paying something like one tenth of a percent. That's a big difference when it comes to, you know, ultimately to your bottom line. And that's why we're able to offer the same efficiencies to our franchisees, the main efficiencies, which really are cost of software, cost of money, cost of workers' comp. We're able to offer those, um, you know, we're able to offer, which is pretty much mostly all you get in administrative efficiencies that, you know, that, that you could get if you expanded on your own. So we're still offering all of that. And yet without the need to have this big uh, regional, you know, sort of all these regional managers. And the point is, is everybody makes more money is really what it comes down to because they're just- Is it because you're, you're aligning incentives so that you don't need this kind of super, uh, th this level of supervision or this bureaucracy to kind of monitor people because the incentives are aligned? Well, that's right. And, 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 and so there's, and it really, it comes down to two things is, is one is turnover is a, turnover is a killer. Is that if, if you, you know, if you look at when most branches basically collapse, and this is whether it's in a, it's sort of the traditional corporate owned environment or in the franchise, it's, it's almost always associated with turnover. Being franchised essentially dramatically minimizes turnover. And, you know, it's one of those things, would you rather have, you know, in a five year period, would you rather have a branch that does 4 million for the first two years and then only a million for the next three or would you rather have one that does three for five years? You know, you might not get the high highs of the two, four, you know, the two, $4 million years, but you get a straight up experience of the three. Well, okay. Everybody can do math, right? That's 15 million yeah. in sales versus 10 million in sales. I'll take the, you know, I'll take the three every time. And so what happened even like with command and, and at like, a, at a more profitable level, Exactly. It's, more it's, it's, it's just consistently, yeah. it tends to just be consistently profitable. And, and so what happens, and that's why, you know, that, that like higher quest branches did on average about 50% more sales per unit than command center did. Now it's not that command center was bad in the traditional sense of corporate owned stores. It's just simply their turnover was appalling and their turnover was exactly what it typically is in the staffing industry. But again, you know, whereas from a, from a franchising standpoint, we have people who are minding the stores that are directly incentivized to do well because you know, if the branch does really well, they do really well. And, you know, and therefore it's worked really well, you know, it's worked really well for us. And it allows us sort of to go back to your question one or two questions ago, as far as that's where from the growth side of it is, is that obviously I, I can assure you that we would have never have attempted to buy Link and Snelling sort of within three weeks of each other had we run the corporate model because we'd have been chasing, and of course they're, they're primarily franchised. So it's not a, it, it, it's not, it, it, it's not really a completely fair comparison, but let's just say they had been public, they had been, uh, you know, corporate owned stores. We wouldn't have been able to do it because we'd had so much turnover in that period of time 
that we would have probably destroyed at least a third of the value within two months because people would have quit. But as it is, you know, again, it's not to say that some, some people may not be excited about the transition and we may lose a couple of franchisees over time and that's okay. I mean, you know, we're not, you know, if, if we want people in our system that believe in it and that want to, to be in it in the long run, the important part is, is, is that we're doing our part, which is basically we're supplying the money, we're supplying the workers' comp, we're supplying the software, we're supplying the administrative support for our franchisees. That really hasn't changed. Now, we think and we hope that by now being larger in scale when combining you know, the, the link and the selling is that our national accounts program will become far more meaningful for in which obviously inures to the benefit of our franchisees. And also, you know, it creates, and I, I talked about this on our earnings call last week, is that I think just as important, it creates a much firmer platform on which to sell new franchises as well, because by having uh, more branches, now, you know, you know, now it, it makes the name more valuable. And the name being more valuable makes it easier to sell and gives more of a reason for people to want to want to buy uh, buy or open a new Snelling office is because now I'm part of an 80 or 90 branch network instead of a 40 branch network. And again, it becomes much more well known. And that's um, you know really one of the big promises of these acquisitions. But anyway, the point is is that. All the people are still, you know, the vast majority of the people, I say, I won't say all, the vast majority of the people are the exact same people. They're all, they're basically all still in place, which makes making these acquisitions far easier. And to the extent that they're far easier, makes them more likely in the future. So why, why aren't other people or other companies in the industry doing this? It seems like a no brainer and even even more like you, not only why are people doing this, but like what's the competitive advantage of HireQuest or what you're offering? What's stopping me from being like, oh my gosh, you know, this is a, a business with over 50% operating margins. It's asset light. You have these incentivized owners. It sounds great. Like what's stopping me from doing this or any competing company? Yeah, and that's a that's so that's a that's an interesting. It it leads to a story, um, you know. It leads to first of all to one story. So back maybe five years ago, four years ago, a friend of mine had put me in touch with a SPAC. Of course, SPACs are all the rage right now. Back then, they were still much newer, and I remember, and I'm like, well, okay, I want to go. You know, really serious about going public. And the SPAC would be as good of way, you know, would be potentially as good of way as any, you know, and I spoke to the person who was running it, but I just, but it was like, but it's like, look, I'm not going to change my business methodology in, in doing this. You know, if, if you're interested, we're going to remain franchising. And, you know, the, 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 and the funny part about it is of course our revenues are a lot lower because we report you know, we report our, you know, we report our revenues, which are our royalties. And so they're, they're pretty low. And it was funny. And I, I remember taking the meeting. So I'm in Manhattan, I'm talking to the guy and I, it was like, wasn't four or five minutes into the call. And it's like, oh, you mean your underlying, you know, your underlying sales are 160 million, 150 million, whatever they were at the time. It's like, oh, well, you know, we need to, you know, basically, we need to convert these to company owned and we can give some stock to the franchisees to make it, you know, to make it, uh, you know, to have a much higher top, you know, much higher top line. Nobody wanted to screw with our small top line. That's really what it came down to. And I, the, the meeting lasted about 12 minutes because as soon as I said, it's like, listen, I'm not going to do that because basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to destroy my company for the initial, you know, for the initial valuation. That's not what it is. And so that was a long way of getting around to is a lot of people chase after the high top line and they just sit there and, 
you know, all they want to look at is, is, you know, so for example, if obviously our, you know, if you, if you count our system-wide sales that sort of that are underlying what our reported revenues are, you know, when you rolled up, you know, Snelling, Link, and HireQuest Direct, you know, it's pushing $330, $340 million, you know, in the middle of a pandemic. Well, that sounds a lot more impressive than, you know, $25 million or whatever it is of revenues. Sounds a lot more impressive. And that's what people, ch and that's what a lot of people chase after. To me, I don't care about that. I don't really care about the revenues. What I care about is, is the net income. And um, anyway, so that's, that is one, that is one problem. The, the you know, and the other, there is a trade-off. I mean, the, the, one of the, one of the trade-offs is if you're doing company owned stores, you could conceivably just keep pyramiding acquisition upon acquisition in one market. Take a market, let's say like the size of Chicago. Chicago's probably, I don't know what the numbers really are, but I'll bet you it's probably a three or four billion dollar staffing industry, uh, you know, staffing industry in Chicago. You can do a lot of acquisitions in one city and keep pyramiding it onto your company owned location. And, and, and whereas with the franchise, if we hire a bad, you know, if we sign up a bad franchisee, we, we, we could be capped um, by their, you know, by their performance. And so I think that's also part of the reason why some, uh, you know, why some people, um, you know, stay away from it as well. But, but to be honest with you, there, there's the, the, the only part that I would say that, so it's like, well, why wouldn't you do it? Or why wouldn't anyone else do it? It takes more than what you think to get this scale. It really takes more than what it take, than what you think to get the scale. And, you know, the, the underlying higher quest is, so I've been in the industry for 30, I don't know, 31 years or something like that. Dan McCanner, who, who was my president and COO for, he was, we were partners for 27 years. He had 40 years experience. Most of our people all have, you know, uh, our VP of ops has 30 years to properly run it as well. It's not, you know, look, I mean, I guess you could get some smart financial guys who, um, you know, could, could go out, get a big line of credit and maybe get a, you know, talk a, I don't think they could, but maybe they could talk a workers comp carrier into putting together a big program. Doesn't mean you still know the industry. And the one thing that's sort of important it, 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 in my view, and for other people, it's not, you know, maybe this is old fashioned, but for me, you know, I don't ever want to be in a situation ever with higher quest where it's, you know, where basically the people in senior management have really no real knowledge of what actually goes on in a branch. I mean, I, 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 again, I started, I, I, I worked in a branch 30 years ago and I, I, you know, after Hurricane Andrew, I mean, I'm, I, after Hurricane Andrew, I literally slept in my branch for six weeks. It was, it was so nuts. So it makes, it makes, it makes my senior management team, they're empathetic to what goes on in the branches because they know what's going on there. And to me, it's sort of like trying to try, you know, trying to, uh, you know, trying to win the Masters golf tournament without a putter. It's like, look, you got, you know, you got to know what you're doing, and you got to go with the right skills. And I guess what I'm saying is, is that does create somewhat of a barrier. Is is that you need, you need the financial abilities to put together a decent sized company like Higher Quest. And yet, I still think, by the same token, you really need to have that group of managers, when I say managers, so like in the, in the senior management, that really, again, understand and appreciate what goes on at the franchise. Level. And I, I think you can tell that, I think you can tell that, by the way, just from the nuance is that when you have decades of experience and you can, you can create a model that is profitable, even in the global financial crisis, and that your model was even profitable in when everything shut down in the second quarter of last year with COVID, 
And, you know, my experience with business is just the nuance. I mean, to understand exactly how workers comp works and then to provide it well for all of your franchisees and then to create a system of incentives because you know what it was like when you ran a branch. I think, I mean, that makes a, a, a ton of sense to me. Um, yeah, and it would be hard to replicate, uh, at least from what you're describing of your senior management team. It, it would be hard. It, it really would be hard to replicate it. I mean, again, if you tried hard enough and you had enough money to get it started, you certainly could. But then you're better off just buying our stock and then you get it. Yeah. The, 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 the thing is, though, and, and, and it is really true as far as the nuances it's it's funny because i was talking to somebody who was in the senior management of a of a large competitor and it's just funny how even you know again if you don't really understand the industry it's easy to sit there and say gee seattle build two million last year this year they should build 2.2 million we should get 10 percent growth that may completely ignore what's going on really at the local you know, the local level. It's not like, well, gee, we'll raise everybody's prices 10% and we're just going to get 10%. You know, we're just going to get 10% growth. It just doesn't work. It just doesn't work that way. You might have a big project that's ending. You might have a, an HR manager that quits and you lose your third largest account. And you may be lucky to get 80% of your prior year's sales, but it's understanding those types of things. But again, it goes back to, and then it's like by having a franchisee there though, they're going to work harder to replace that to replace that business they're not going to just sit back on their their past uh you know their their past results they're going to go out and they're going to replace that third largest client that loses or that they lost but it's but it really is important to be um you know again to have an understanding of what's going there because the very first company i worked for in the staffing industry and there was always, and there, there's always a certain amount of tension between the people who are at the corporate headquarters and in the offices. But again, that's why to me, it's so important to have people that have been there is, is to at least understand, again, to understand what goes on. Cause it's not a, it's not an easy business. Um, it, you know, it's not, it's not an easy business and it's not one that's given to, um, you know, we're a people business and people are, people are messy. I mean, you know, it's, it's, you can on paper, you can look at a resume and sit there and say, this is the perfect fit. And your client may sit there and say, this is a piece of crap. You don't know. You just don't know because people are people. And the, the client might've just been having a bad day and saying, I don't like people with red hair. I don't like people who went to XYZ university. It's the, it's the craziest thing. And, but if, if you're, but if you're a people person, you know, you work through that, but other people find it exhausting. And um, anyway, and it, you can, it, you can see that in the two, you know, if you just go to Snelling, that was, I mean, this is maybe part of the opportunity for HireQuest is Snelling was a subsidiary of a, either a bankrupt or a company that was in financial distress. Right. Right. Yeah. And so, I think you told me before that prior to the deal, you were visiting a franchisee of Snelling and the person told you, this is the first time in, in like 10 or 12 years that anyone from senior management has ever visited me. Exactly. And, no, and that was very eye-opening to me that you could have a company where there's no communication going on in person. Right. And, and, and that's, and that is a, the, the, the funny part about it is one of the, one of the people we, we added a person who, I mean, like literally, you know, and again, part of it's how you, how you look at it and, and how you look at your franchise community and, you know, you can start taking away support functions and sit there and say, see, now I just increased you know, I just, I just improved my bottom line because I got rid of these four people that were all each making 50 grand a year. Congratulations to me. Now I'm making 200 grand more. In the meantime, that's what might be well be making your franchisees really successful. And then you start creating resentment. And that's where, 
you know, our goal is to, I mean, our goal is always to never lose, is to never lose a franchise. Now, again, some may, you know, we, we can't always adhere to that, but, but we're certainly going to always try to do that. But there's, you know, there's plenty of other companies out there where they're, they, they just look at it as if we can cut our costs a little bit and the franchisees don't have a chance and don't have a choice. And it's like, yeah, but they do. And their efforts will reflect if they know that you're really working for them, you're out there, you're doing national accounts. A good example, for example, you know, is national accounts. National accounts, we, funny thing is, is we really probably on a direct basis, we probably don't more than maybe we break even on national accounts. We might make a little bit of money, but really we don't make money on national accounts. And even though I put that, so even though we put that out there, it's sort of like, well, that's part of the reason why we do this. National accounts are more what makes being a franchisee valuable, right? So it's like, I can go out and sit there and say, okay, 10%, 15% of our business comes from national accounts. So if you buy a franchise of ours in Pocatello, Idaho, there's a good chance that just through national accounts, I'm practically paying for the royalty. That makes it easier to sell franchises. It makes it easier to retain franchises. Now, I may not make that much on the national accounts, but again, if it, if it makes it so that I have far less turnover and that I can sell them easier, that's where I get my money back, not, not specifically. Then there's a lot of people who would just look at it and say, why the heck am I going to have national accounts? By the time I'm done paying, I don't make any money. It does, da, 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 da. It's like, look, you got to look at the broader picture. And the question and is, the long term. Right. And the long -term are you adding long -term value? value? Right. And are you adding value to your franchisees? Are you adding value? You know, you know, and if you are, you're going to have a you know, you're going to have a vibrant group of franchisees. And if you have, and if your franchisees are vibrant, you're going to be vibrant. If you have a bad group, you're going to struggle. You know, and is that why the, you're able to, uh, like these previous two, uh, you know, Snelling and Link, is that why you're able to buy companies for what looks like on a normalized basis, like very low valuations, including Command Center, which basically, from what I can tell you, bought for free or almost paid to acquire when you converted the franchise. Is it because the franchise system, you know, whether for a variety of reasons or the internal structure was just, was suffering or just that people were not looking at the long-term? Why are you able to come in and seemingly acquire companies for very, very low valuations. So, you know, and, and Link and Snelling were two very different situations. Snelling, you know, Snelling clearly with a, with a bankrupt parent was in, a, it was in a completely different situation and, um, you know, and had had financial difficulties for a long time. And so it really, there really weren't going to be many buyers for that. Um, there, there weren't going to be many buyers for it for a variety of factors. And, 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 you know, Link on the other hand, you know, was, and it's a long story that's not really appropriate for me to share, but, but it's just, that was just, that became available due to a change in plans by the, by the former owners. Um, you know, and it just worked out that way. The, 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 the thing is, and this is where it goes back to, um, there aren't, the part of the reason the, 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 the valuations are relatively attractive is that other than going public, there, there aren't a lot of good exit options for smaller franchisors. And, you know, the funny in the staffing that, industry, in the staffing industry, in, in the staffing industry, in that, you know, and even for that matter, it would be far more difficult for us in, in just in, in full disclosure is that, you know, let, let's say now we've got something like 40 branches, I think, let's say combined in Texas now, 
So our ability, if we found somebody who was already a franchisor in Texas and they operated it under the name, you know, Bill Staff, Aaron. A A Aaron, Aaron franchise. Right, Aaron Staffing. Aaron Staffing, that would be really hard or almost impossible for us to buy. So somebody like Link, as an example, really, you know, can't really sell to Manpower, can't really sell to, you know, a DECO or anything like that. So they didn't leave necessarily huge amounts, you know, I'm saying huge numbers of potential buyers, other than maybe strategics or private equity groups. And frankly, as good as the deal, you know, as, as, as fair of a deal as it was for us, a private equity group would have given them less. So, you know, or would have put on the conditions that would have made it worse. So really it was a win-win, you know, it was a win-win for the, for the trustee of Snelling and it was a win-win with, with the sellers of Link, frankly. We were the best buy. Gotcha. Can you, so can you talk about the opportunity, continuing on this theme of kind of growing, is normally when you acquire uh, companies, uh, you, it, they call it rolling up an industry. And I even brought this up to you and you say, no, I, I don't actually think we're rolling up the industry. I think we're rolling down the industry. Can you explain what you meant by rolling down an industry? Yeah, absolutely. And so there are, even now, you could look at a couple of competitors of, of ours that are you know publicly traded that almost their whole stated goal is we're just going to go out and we're going to we're going to buy 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 we're going to we're going to you know we're going to we're just going to keep buying and we're going to get efficiencies and we're going to we're going to make a fortune what that ignores again is this is a people this is a people business and when you go and you buy a person's business and they've been running it and let's just say they've been there in Cincinnati Ohio and they've been doing it for 30 years and a lot of their clients are good friends of theirs and stuff. You're not going to walk in. You're going to be lucky if you keep 80% of their business. And all these efficiencies they say they're going to get, they're going to more than lose. And so by a roll down, what I just mean is, is look, we're going to take, even in a case like that, let's say we, we take over, we, well, we don't have an office in Cincinnati. So we go out and we buy a person in Cincinnati. Now, the person who might be the seller you know, maybe they're a 68 year old who's been running it for 40 years and they're ready to retire. But meanwhile, for the last 10 years, they're, they're, the, you know, he, you know, her office manager has been running it really for the last 10 years anyway. We give the ability to cash out the 68 year old, have the manager come in and become the franchisee. And so it's sort of it's rolled down. Yeah, okay, the, the real value ended up in the hands of a person who knows the business the best and cares the most about it. And, and has been running the business. And has been running it. And what you've really just done is taken out all of the operating risk because you don't have that turnover. And, and so wherever we can do that, we're always gonna do that first because that's what really matters to the, you know, that's what really matters to maintaining a healthy, you know, maintaining a healthy business. And so, you know, the, the, the reality is, and that's where, so what it comes back to, and then when you start, you start looking at more, let's say a, a longer term sort of evolution of the company is, you know, as I said before, you know, a company like I'll say manpower. Manpower could make 50 acquisitions in Chicago and just keep pyramiding those companies on it. As a franchisor, we can't, we can't do that, not easily. And so we're never even, we're not going to, we may well not ever get to the point of, let's say manpower is in Chicago. We may hit the best franchisee there and maybe we do, maybe we do go toe to toe with them, but maybe not. It's not really, you know, but what's funny about it is, is that we're not, on the other hand, we're not restricted to, um, you know, trying to force too much out of, out of a market or out of a sort of a, of a business type. What we really do is we offer, 
as much as anything, we're a finance and insurance company for people with large payrolls in fragmented, basically in, in a fragmented industry. But the, the dynamics that exist in the staffing business are identical to what exists, let's say, in the security guard business. Security guard business is a, I don't, know, I don't even know how big it is. I mean, it's a multi-billion dollar, multi-billion dollar uh, industry. But realistically, it's the same thing. There's all sorts of people out there that, that know how to run a security guard company, but they don't have three, $400,000 to, to float the payroll before they get paid by their clients. And so either they stay trapped in their, you know, in their job as a branch manager for, you know, Securitas or whoever, you know, but they can't, they can't branch out. Well, realistically, again, we can offer our same services to allow that person to get into business and to become an entrepreneur and to, to really sort of fulfill their own dreams by, you know, by just doing what we're doing in the staffing industry. And so my point is, is that if you start thinking about it, there are so many industries out there, whether it's commercial landscaping, whether it's parking lot cleaning, whether it's commercial janitorial, there are, there are all sorts of applications for exactly the type of franchising that we do. And so we, you know, the, the, to me, the ultimate beauty of HireQuest is that we don't have to get ourselves locked in a spot where in order to grow, we have to take really low margin business or go into really bad regulatory states or anything like that. All we have to do is move over and just sit there and say, hey, we're going to start doing security guard franchising. And then we're going to start doing, you know, again, with the same characteristics of what we do, what we do now, which is we process a ton of payroll very efficiently. And um, so and that value, and just in terms of taking the people, that are actually doing the work or running a branch or who want to run a branch and have the capabilities, backing them financially by running the payroll, backing them with the workers comp, which is now spread over a much larger, providing software and the, the ability to support them. You can go into other verticals, like you mentioned, security guards or landscaping, and offer the same hire quest model and, and align the incentives correctly so that these people can be success can be really successful. And in a way, you're kind of, if I take that phrase that you used before, rolling down the responsibility and the incentives as close as possible to the, well, the jobs that are actually being done. Is that a correct summary? No, that, that's a, no, that's a, and that's a very good way of, yeah, that's a very good way of looking at it. And, and the thing is, is that, like I said, we're not going to, let's say, wear out our hammer on the anvil of consolidating, let's say, the staffing industry, because a lot of people have tried it with a lot more money than what we have. And it doesn't, it really just doesn't work because it's a, again, it's a people, it's a people business. And the security guard business is the same, you know, again, it's the same basic way is you still have to be hungry, right? And, and so what we want to do is we want to help hungry people. You know, we want to, we want to get them, again, the back office support that they need. They know how to run, you know, they know how to, they know how to staff a, a you know, a 30 or 40 person guard account. That doesn't mean that they really can, that they have the resources to, like, like I said, to finance that payroll, to uh, make payroll tax deposits and stuff like that. And so we give them the opportunity to flourish. And, and so, the, so the, the key is, is that, again, that gives us the ability to continue to grow with, with no real, you know, with no real limitations. I, I mean, I shouldn't say it's, there's obviously, there's, I guess at some point you run out, but these are huge industries. These are huge industries. And, and again, we're not looking to have to get towards the saturation point to where we're going to start just chasing, you know, chasing. You're looking for niche opportunities to take this high margin business 
to incentivize people to be entrepreneurs, these hustlers to go out. And this is, if I go back to the very beginning, this is why you're public. It's yeah. basically to dramatically expand what you can do with the higher quest model. That's that, right. It's, it's exciting. It's exciting right. to- and there's tons of, Right, and there's tons of application for it. And, and yet, again, look, before I, before I got into the staffing business, I was in the banking business. And so by nature, you know, I, I am, I'm still somewhat concerned, you know, I'm, I'm conservative. We could, we could, we could probably, you know, our ROE could be almost infinite because the vast majority of our assets are AR, which are easily financeable. But, you know, I want to stay, you know, I want to, I want to keep a strong capital structure. Number one, simply because, you know, I, I want to sleep at night. You know, but the other part is, is it, it gives us the ability to take on opportunities like Snelling or Link when they present themselves, whereas they wouldn't otherwise. You know, if we if we had been you know highly leveraged, we we really wouldn't have either been able to or wouldn't have taken on that opportunity. And so, to your point, it's just a long way of saying, you know, being public gives us an opportunity to make sure that we can we can retain again, a solid balance sheet. So it's like, so if I can, like, I guess to convey something is just sort of like, you know, at least as long as I'm the CEO, we're not going to be some highly levered company that, because that's, that's the other part about all of this. And, you know, about this whole process is, you know, this is all about making money, not just now, not next quarter or three quarters from now, but really five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. And, you know, in, in order to do that, it's important to retain a responsible, you know, a responsible capital structure. And some of the very best opportunities that I've had over the years were basically because other people got themselves overextended. And I'm not even, I'm not talking about Lincoln and Snelling. I'm talking about prior deals where people, you know, they, they get desperate. Well, you're literally talking on a day when the news is a hedge fund that blew a family office that blew up because they levered five times over and they, they basically everyone knows about it this past weekend. So you're you're preaching to the choir and, and also reflects you're the l largest shareholder management inside insiders own the, own the majority of the company. I mean, you're clearly building this for the long term. If you were just looking to kind of extract short-term profits, I, I don't know that you would have gone public or that you would be utilizing the capital structure or how you've been operating. So it's very clear um, just from following you about Listen, there's no question. This is all designed, this is all designed for the long-term and will continue to be designed for the long-term. Like I said, as long as I'm CEO, it, it, it will it will always be designed for the long term, and um, you know, and that's where sometimes it's easy to chase shiny objects. And you know, there at the same time we were off, you know, offered the opportunity for these the two acquisitions we just did. There was another one that was far larger, and it was just like it would have, you know, frankly, it would have been, you know, it would have been really. Um, you know, it looked sexy from from a top line standpoint. It'll look sexy, but you know, but it's like it had so many danger signs on it, where it's like, nah, we're not gonna, we're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna touch that because, you know, we're at a point where, um, you know, as the economy normalizes here, you know, hopefully, you know, hopefully realistically, I would say, you know, as the the vaccines become fully available to, to everybody. I mean, the, I do, ex, you know, I would certainly expect the economy to return to pretty much normal by the fourth quarter, hopefully at least. Um, and, and so we have good things in place as it is. Why would we risk, you know, why would we risk what's already, you know, a great story and a great situation that you know we could do the acquisitions that we did you know almost for cash you know 
we could do almost the same set of acquisitions each year, you know, going forward. Why would I mess with that? But not only that, what I love about how resilient your business model is, is because if you can stay profitable in the second quarter when the economy ground all, then I don't know many people that were staffing anything. And you could not only be profitable, but thrive and come out on the other side. It gives you all of these opportunities and just shows how strong uh, your franchise system is, how strong your company is which in the long term just builds a greater foundation. So like, uh, I mean, this is what I see and what, what has attracted me so much to, uh, to not only investing in your company, but following your, uh, you and your company. Thank you so much for doing this interview. I've learned a lot about incentives, the importance of people, the importance of experience. Um, and thank you so much, Rick. I appreciate it. Thank you, Aaron.